delegating, checking on things, modeling, keeping people accountable, that means that you'll be able to accomplish way more. So by remembering that after you delegate something, you don't have to check everything they do every week. All you have to do is once in a while, take one thing and drill down and look, look for every detail. Does that make sense? I love this quote by uh, Darwin. It's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. So make sure, make sure that every day you get up and you're, like you said, if you're a self-starter and you're, you're, you're an entrepreneur or you're working independently, make sure you expect to have those things you're going to accomplish, but be ready for a monkey wrench to, to monkey wrench to be thrown into your plans because that's the only way you can really um, emotionally deal with things. Be ready for something to change. Another key is try to assign a value to what you're doing. One thing that helps us save time is I'll sit there with our leadership team and I'll say, you know what, the four of you guys, when you do this billing and we add up the annual revenue, each hour that you spend billing is worth $2,122. If you kind of assign a value to what you're doing, not that we can earn that much, it would be wonderful if we could, but our collective efforts, our collective vision together results in, um, you know, 2100 per hour in time spent. So put a value on your time. And it's not always what you can earn per hour. It's, it's your scope of influence on your organization. Try to get work done early that requires focus and creativity. How many people here are better at doing work that when you concentrate in the morning? I'm just curious by a show of hands. I'm looking around. Okay. How many people are, are more night owls? Yeah. A lot of it depends on your kids, right? <laughs> when they fall asleep and... I, I find that the best way for me to do any work that requires, I know BF Skinner uh, would have to engineer his environment early in the morning to do writing. I'm sure Dr. Aubrey Daniels has had to discipline himself to write. And for me, it's anything that requires thought and concentration in order to not be inter in order to not be um, interrupted every three minutes. Then I, it has to be done in the morning before all the fires come. You might want to go off the grid. This is another strategy. Not everyone's going to go to an island, so you might end up at your local coffee shop. Go where you don't know anyone. Turn off all your notifications. Turn them off. If you're distracted every three minutes and it takes 11 minutes to refocus, then wouldn't it be appropriate to turn off all your notifications and just focus for one hour? That one hour you can leverage your time and produce uh, great results. Did you ever watch the news? It's very rarely good news. <laughs> it's almost, it's like toxic. Almost everything on, everything on there is about murders and kidnappings. These things just throw you off. Either turn off all notifications like news or put some background music in. I'm getting really uh, granola here. Create rituals. Develop daily routines and rituals that help you get in the habit of discipline. Okay? Some of our best leaders around, Mark Zuckerberg, um, the creator of Facebook, he actually, <laughs> every, every morning he picks from 20 identical gray shirts. Literally. He has 20 shirts that he wears. And he doesn't, he has enough decisions to make all day about a, a billion dollar company. He limits his decisions just so he doesn't have to think. I hope he washes them. Bill Gates, uh, he has the same exact routine, routine every morning. In order to achieve something great, he stays focused. He has rituals, and that one of those rituals is simply riding on the treadmill and looking at his goals for the day. Remembering why he's trying to change the world. Skinner. Like I said, Jewel, I was just last Saturday, I was up at uh, Cambridge at B.F. Skinner's house and uh, connected to Harvard for the Skinner Foundation. And, I, and I, was, I was looking at all the books and everything. And I, and I saw that he actually, he really did. Jewel, Julie said that her father actually would arrange his writing environment. So that way, um, he, when before they had different remote controls and stuff, he would actually have... Um, strings and pulleys to turn lights off and switches like all within his reach to make his 
make his work the most focused and the least amount of interruptions as possible. I know it sounds insane, but what I do, every morning when I have to get my work done, I got my water cooler, I got my coffee, my laptop, my Bluetooth, and my, my thousand black shirts that I wear every day. Make your work environment efficient. Make it so that you, it's the easiest possible way of facilitating the concentration work. Because that one hour of concentration could be worth eight hours of distracted work, right? Those other seven hours of your day could be spent with your family or they could be spent doing a hobby or with people that you, you care about. Plenty of data shows exercise, right? Exercise actually can help your productivity. I don't, I'm not a doctor and I don't know all the physiological impacts of it, but I do know that, in, that uh, endorphins and serotonin increases. Um, it enhances your body to, build, to, to transfer glucose. Now, apparently it's okay to have, have Dr. Daniel say, is it okay to have high cholesterol? Because I'm gonna eat eggs like crazy. I, I think I heard you say that. So basically, if you can break and this isn't always possible, but if you can break your day up with exercise midway through, you could be 10 times more focused when you return back to work. You know, if I think of Dr. Parr and Dr. Wilson, if they're trying to do research and write methodological things and to create a, a study for Java, they're, they're sitting there, they're not checking their phones, they're carving out time just to do research, and this is really important. What you do when you are distracted, just jot it down and put it away. As soon as something happens that go, that's on your mind and, and takes you away from a laser focus, jot it down real quick and then put it away. If you're going to have a meeting, we waste so much time in meetings, the bureaucracy of meetings. And then half the time you're in a meeting just to show your face or you're there and you know, uh, like Dr. Daniel said, there's bureaucracies and you can't create change. There's a policy, there's a rule. You're just in a meeting to be there. You can make, you when you facilitate a meeting, because most of you are leaders in this room, the best thing you can do, circulate the agenda of all the items that the people in the meeting have to report out, and then you stay focused. So we, we like to use, uh, uh, we, we like to use those, those task lists. So when, I, when, I, when we end up having a group meeting, everyone has, has their task list, they report it out, and we get in and out of the door. So I just made up something. Were, was data submitted on the first of the month? Were progress reports updated? Did you communicate with the case manager? Find your agency, find out in your industry what your key metrics are for success and put those into an agenda and require the, the people that report to you to report out these, these things. It gives you structure and saves time because everyone knows that when you have to report something out, it serves as an SD or sets the occasion for the behavior to happen. Does that make sense? Reporting, self-monitoring and reporting out sets the occasion for the behavior to, to be more likely to occur. It's better than showing up in a meeting and you as the leader asking around, hey, did you do this? They're like looking down, no, no, not really. They just, they just tell you everything they did. The typical worker wastes 1.5 hours per day. And our company, uh, clinical associate, averages 55,000. So when we add it up, that would mean they're wasting $10,290 a year. It's kind of concerning. So I hope that's not exactly happening with us, but we're, we're constantly doing leadership and time management training. So that means if all of our clinical associates wasted that 1.5 hours, we'd waste 2.1 million. Wasting time is of epidemic proportions these days, especially with all the things that, that are bells and whistles and notifications, right? You're probably having them right now. It's probably hard to not look at your phone, especially when I'm talking, I'm on point number 15. What could you do with two point? Uh, I'm thinking we could buy 4,666 iPads because that's something where schools are constantly asking us for. Time is money. Uh, what are people doing when they're wasting their time? A uh, US Gallup poll suggests that 24% of people are, are texting and calling. Again, I don't know how, if this information can be replicated. These are polls that were done recently by Career, career Builder. People are on the internet. 21% surfing for personal reasons. People gossip. Raise your hand if you see people gossiping at the office. <laughs> Everyone's like, no. <laughs> Wait a second. Some of you <laughs> Wait, you work here. <laughs> Let me ask you. 
Who who do you think's most disengaged? Millennials that are in their twenties or uh, traditional generations over forty? Millennials? Boom, you're right. So the, the, the data is suggesting that millennials, maybe because we have so much more access to technology. Frequent distractions are also causing errors. I love this one. The doctor says, uh, doctor gets a call. Um, I'm not Mr. White and the guy at the table, that's me. So basically surgical mistakes, they've done studies 44% more often do, do doctors make mistakes. They, they did studies where they, I hope they can replicate this. I hope they don't hurt anyone, but they do mock studies where they interrupt the doctor and determine um, their level of mistakes. So 44% of them mistake rate when you're interrupted. Distractions are so frequent that uh, the Wall Street Journal, again, I don't know how much of this is, is, uh, is re replicated, but the, the latest data I saw was that we're distracted every three minutes. So it takes us 11 minutes to gain refocus. What I try to do is I'm trying to accomplish as much as I can. I'm either spending time with my daughter, Marlene, Justin, and Ben, or I'm working. So what I try to do is minimize my distractions as much as possible to the point where even like a, a, a buzzer on my door where you can unlock like a school, you hit a button. But even that became a distractor. I started staring at the buzzer. I'm not kidding. Like I'll find a reason to, to procrastinate and I'll stare at the buzzer. Multitasking is almost at an all-time uh, high. People, <laughs> people feel that they can multitask. CNN actually uh, reports, again, to CNN, so who knows about the popular media. Uh, I didn't find this in Java. One day, it hope, hopefully, we will study this. But uh, when, we're, when we're multitasking, it brings our, our, IQ our IQ down 10 points as though we're stoned. Literally, this is what CNN reports. So if every three minutes we're distracted and it takes 11 minutes to recover, then most of us are probably walking around half-baked, literally. And what's distracting us? Tech, technology, Facebook, uh, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Google+. For me, the one, there's six of them that are the worst and they are the weapons of mass distraction. I see them as blo they're blogging, Facebook, Twitter. So we have some, one of the concerns is that we have so many choices day to day that we're barraged with with all these notifications. And did you ever wake up on certain days, and especially when you're trying to be autonomous and you're a consultant and you're and you're working from home, you're basically blasted with all these options and you get up and you don't even know where to start. Raise your hand if you had that feeling where you're looking at the day and you don't even know where to start. You, you look like this, deer in the headlights, right? One of the first strategies of effective time management would be develop your leadership. And Dr. Aubrey Daniels talks about this a lot. Develop a model of pay for performance rather than just putting in time. You're going to want to waste time if you're just on salary. So let's talk about self-control. What, what is it, right? Um, the pre-MAC principle of doing something undesirable, following it by something that's higher probability or more desirable is the pre-MAC principle. So a lot of people might want to characterize that as self-control. We just we sat at the office one day, actually it was Amanda Mecker there, and we were sitting there brainstorming, what would be a good behavioral definition? It's still a little bit loose. What would be a good behavioral definition of self-control? And I, I like this, daily actions that forego small immediate reinforcers to access larger remote wards that drive success. Because think about it, most of our social problems throughout the world, our workplace problems, our health, they're usually because we can't forego the small immediate reinforcer that's in front of us to have what's called delayed gratification to wait for the larger, more remote reward. For example, that piece of cake that's sitting in front of you. You have diabetes and you're overweight and you have a piece of cake in front of you. Hmm, do I eat that or do I wait four months for my blood sugar to go down and drop 10 pounds? I'm going to go with the immediate free reinforcer set. Folks, I mean, think about it. That's all self-control really is, right?